In a medium-sized city in the Rust Belt portion of our country, a community decides to hold an event. It's just a community event where people can come out for some entertainment, <clears throat> and the evening will be concluded by a guest speaker. The guest speaker was Bill Butterworth, and he spoke on family, spending family time together. And at the end, he had a number of people that wanted to come up and comment and share their stories and also their appreciation of his, his speech. At the end of the line is a guy that's waiting for quite a while. He waits 45 minutes to hear this, to have a few words with the speaker. And he says this, <clears throat> you really got me with that talk, man. He paused, looking straight into my eyes. And I could tell by looking into his face that he wasn't joking. His dark eyes welled up with tears and he took the occasion of shaking my hand to hold on to it, guiding me over to a spot backstage where we would enjoy greater privacy. When you told those stories about spending time with your kids, you reminded me of something my son to me said, said to me a couple of weeks ago. Once again, he paused, his face tightening with emotion. You want to hear what my kid said to me? He asked. I swallowed hard and said, yes, I knew this would be a difficult moment for both of us. My little boy is eight years old, he began softly. He came up to me the other night right before it was time to put him to bed. I had only been home from work for a half an hour. We'd been spending very little time together. Anyways, he came up to me and said, Daddy, I've been saving all my money. And I thought, well, that's great. So I congratulated him on his accomplishment. No, you don't understand, Daddy. I've been saving all my money for weeks and months now. I let him tell me how excited he was and about how faithfully he had been putting his pennies, nickels, and dimes into a jar in his bedroom. Daddy, I've got $8.40, he bragged. Once again, I complimented him on his frugality. My boy went off to his room to play for a bit, but before long, he was back at my feet. He had something on his mind he wanted to clear up. Do you know why, what I want to do with my $8.40, Daddy, he asked. What, I replied. I want to give that money to you, he announced. T to me? Yes, Daddy, I want to give it to you. Why, son? Well, Daddy, if I give you this money, do you think you could stay home from work sometime and play with me? At this point, my new friend broke down and began to sob. He had me all figured out. He continued once he regained some composure. Even at eight years old, he knew what motivated his father, money. And he was willing to buy his father's attention. Welcome to Encore, where we continue the conversation around the Word of God. Ed McNeil here with Pastor Brandon, Pastor Jory. Just read an excerpt from a book called Balancing Work and Life from Bill Butterworth. <clears throat> and I thought I would start this session as we are here to comment and to have a discussion about the introduction to Colossians from Pastor Brett. And I thought this had an awful lot to do with the focus of our culture today and who we are. We're so consumed with money and, and, and the things, material things, that sometimes we miss the point. And I just thought this might be a good introduction to some of the things that I think we're going to discuss over the course of going through Colossians and understanding who we are. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Um, I know he talked about Colossians. I know he also focused in on Revelation chapter 3 and the fact that this is the Laodicean age. But man, gentlemen, please just tell me how the Lord spoke to you as we open this discussion. Yeah, well, well, just to piggyback on your story, I've heard, I've heard a version of that before where a kid asks his dad how much does he make per hour, and his dad's like, that's none of your business, <laughs> and uh, ends up that the kid wanted to buy an hour of his time to play with him, so he wanted to know mm. how much to pay, you know. Yeah. But this, this reminds me of a story of my own son, actually, who on, oh, man, I think it was his birthday. Yeah. might have been Father's Day. Comes in. He's got a note taped to a little folded up piece of cloth on our bed. And me and my wife come in there and we're like, what is this thing? <clears throat> it was actually his little wallet that he had. And the note said, uh, dear mom and dad, uh, please give me a baby brother. You can have all of my money. And uh, why, this, why he even made that connection was because he's asking for a baby brother for a while. <laughs> This is years ago. I'm an old man now, right? <clears throat> uh, but uh, 
I said, listen, baby's uh, baby brother costs too much money. <laughs> well, he gives me this note, like, here's the money. You can have my money. I want, I want the baby brother. And so just, just to kind of think about this, like, kids know. Like, I'm even saying it with my words, like, it's too expensive for me to give you what you need. Like, it costs money to get the things that we want. And he's making a correlation, like, oh, if it's just money that, that buys happiness and the things I need, I'll give money. Yeah. I'll figure that out. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know. It's the age we live in. We it are is. rich and increasing goods and have need of nothing, right? There you go. And so, um, but that was, I thought, man, that just reminded me of that. Made my wife and I smile and kind of tear up a bit at the same time, right? But, uh, you know, this, this whole book being, uh, or the whole message being an introduction to Colossians and being tied to Laodicea. Uh, I know that Brett has mentioned, and around here we mention all the time, Laodicea, Laodicea. Um, about five years ago, my wife was making that connection in her Bible study that we're in a Laodicean age. And to my uh, shame, I was telling her, that's not, you can't make that kind of connection biblically. Like, this isn't an age of Laodicea. Like, that, that's a church, and that's a people type, maybe, or a type of church, but that doesn't mean that we're in that kind of age. What do you, what do you like reading? Like, it was making me mad. I think I was getting mad because she was like, she was understanding the Bible more than I was. Um, but it's just really interesting to me how, and Jory, you just mentioned it like a little bit ago, like the very end of Colossians, it says when you read this epistle, like make sure you read, read it to Laodicea too, because this is like, this is something that they need to hear. And uh, I just thought what a, what a great carve out that Brett did to help us understand like modern day Christianity needs to hear this book. And I hope it takes them two or three years to get through because I want to sit on this for a while. Right. And, and uh, I think it's going to be really good for us to, to kind of dive into knowing that it's from Paul, our apostle, and it's to a church that's in our church age. Yes. Like, man, how pertinent is it for us? It's very pertinent. Yeah, he set the stage for that for yeah. sure. Pastor Jordan. <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, I, Brandon, I think you nailed it. Like, I am definitely excited to camp out here for a good long while. It's been, it's been a while since we've really just taken three or four years out to just go verse by verse through a book, and uh, I'm super excited about that. Uh, Ed, you, you, know, you, you kind of hit along the idea that I was going for. One of the things I was going to talk about was um, Brett brought up this list of names, these powerful and wealthy men uh, in American history, and one of the names that stuck out to me was uh, John Rockefeller. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I, I, my uh, degree is in economics, and so Having a degree in economics, John Rockefeller is somebody that we talked about a lot. And so like, from a historical perspective, I've studied the guy quite a bit. And uh, from a capitalist perspective, from, a, from an American perspective, the guy's a very interesting figure. And uh, by, by all accounts, arguably the wealthiest man that's ever lived in this country. And uh, to hear, I can't remember the exact words that Brett quoted, but you know, basically to get to the end of his life and to look back on it and just say, you know, it was all for nothing. You know, I, I, I would have traded it in a minute for just more time with my family or, or the simple things. Like, I mean, that was, that was just some really powerful stuff. Um, Ed, Ed, you brought up uh, Revelation chapter 3. Um, it just made me think of, uh, let's see, I'll start in verse uh, 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And, you know, you, you already pointed out, Brett made the, co the correlation between Revelation chapter 3, uh, you know, the, the Church of Laodicea, and this epistle to the Colossians. And, you know, if you read through four short chapters, but uh, the word riches appears several times, and, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, every time Christ is, or God is saying, you know, not riches like physical riches, but the true riches are wisdom. You know, if you if you start in uh, chapter two, uh, for I would that you knew the what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my, my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I mean, I, I'm excited to really uh, dive into this and, and to talk about this uh, idea that, you know, we live in an age where even, even in comparison to someone like John Rockefeller, you and I have things that he would have thought was amazing. You and I have comforts and luxuries that, that even he didn't have. I mean, we truly are in an age where, you know, physical things are abounding, but 
spiritual things are are dead. And I mean, I don't, I can't imagine a more uh, apt topic of discussion discussion than than this book. Yes, a um, couple of thoughts. I started just uh, making notes to my notes to myself. One of the notes I just made was. I remember Pastor Bartell being here for a couple of a mission conference a couple of years ago. And in the missions conference, one of his messages was, you've got to give up some of your leisure and some of your luxury. What, what, what kind of sacrifice is that? Now listen, but, but he knows that this is a Laodicean age and he's like, to give up some leisure and luxury is a big deal for Americans, but yet, we're not giving up. He's, say, he's saying you don't need to give up necessities, obviously. You're, you're, we're so far beyond necessities that if you gave up some of these things, maybe God could have some room in your life. And I was like, ouch. Just the fact that those would be the two key points. It's just, it, it just keeps ringing in the back of my mind that he, that he brought that message. But we're talking about some of the wealthiest people in American history, but well, let's just... Talk about the wealthiest guy that has ever graced the planet. <clears throat> and I read in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, starting in verse 4. Listen to what Solomon said. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of provinces. I get me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Here's his conclusion of the matter. Then I looked on all the works that my hand had wrought, and on all the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. The wealthiest man that ever graced this planet said he had it all. I had it all and then some like none before me. And listen, by, uh, like none that has followed. No one has matched this man's wealth. And he said, you know what? As I looked over everything and I got caught up in it, it was all for naught. It was all it was was a distraction to me. How telling is that man yeah uh, in Luke 12 21 it says so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God like the treasures the things we have man we can we can gain and gain and gain and and, and one of his points in the message one of Brett's uh, points was that we have an abundance of things but we don't have an abundant life Mm -hmm. And uh, it's because of our stuff. It's because of our. It's because of the things that we have, and that we we chase down. And uh, even in men's Bible study, he was talking about sacrifice. And, and you're saying we got to give up a little of our luxury. <clears throat> like, if I go to bed at midnight because I'm on call duty with the boys for a while, mm -hmm. and or and all of a sudden it's two o'clock, and I'm like, okay, I got to get to bed because I got four hours of sleep before I got to wake up to go to work. Well, I'm skipping. I'm skipping the luxury uh, of, uh, or I'm, I'm not skipping the luxury of sleep to meet with God I'm skipping the meeting with God to get more luxury and stay in my soft bed and be comfy and play my games and be with my friends and uh, this is Laodicea giving up Call of Duty might be one of the most spiritual things some of us might do <laughs> which how crazy is that right you talk to Philadelphians about that and they what is that I don't even know what that means to them right but for us in Laodicea giving up luxury could be the way that we find more abundance and more riches towards God. Luke 12, 21 says so. Man. You know, uh, kind of 
in contrast to that, something that, that really stood out to me, uh, I get back in Revelation chapter 3, uh, down in verse 21, God says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. To me, that was one of those, I mean, we kind of talked about this, I think, last week or the week before. Like, you know, sometimes there's a verse that just, in and of itself, you can just sit and meditate on that and how amazing that thought is for so long. And, and in, in, in contrast to what you guys were just saying, that is so crazy to me that, you know, the way my mind works, the way the human mind works, we're giving up the least amount. You know, we're, we're not being asked to risk our lives to go to church on a Sunday morning. Like you just said, we're being asked to give up a little bit of sleep to, you know, spend time with God. Like, I mean, that's, that, that's not a real sacrifice in the grand scheme of things. And yet, the promise to the church of Laodicea is that to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. I mean, that's, that's amazing. That is, that's something that I literally can't even fathom that, you know, we're being asked to give up so little and gain so much. Like, that is, that is just truly a, a, an awe-inspiring thought. Yeah, um, if a passage ever stood out from a message, it would be that verse. And it was Brett putting that verse in perspective. How many times have I read that and just glazed, just gloss, uh, glazed over it and missed the intent, which is, this is how off you guys are, but if you would just catch this. In other words, my overlooking the intent of verse 21 just reveals how Laodicea and I am in that how did I, oh man, I know all these other passages, but he's contrasting that and saying, here's what I can offer you if you can get your head right. Oh, I didn't know it said that. Let, welcome yeah. to Laodicea. Yeah, you know verse 17, that you're rich and increase yes. in goods and have need of nothing. <laughs> yes. And you stop there. And you, exactly. I got everything I need. Got everything I need. I'm good to go. I understand, God. I understand. Did you read verse 21? He, and then verse 20, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I didn't hear him out. I didn't hear the whole thing. And so, listen, that's why you can, we can't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There's a message for us. You know what? I found this interesting. I looked at two passages in particular. The passage you referenced just a second, Brandon. Just a moment ago, you were looking at Luke chapter 12. I want to read the verses that preceded. It was part of the message. It said, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man hath brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I'll say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But verse 20, look at that contrast. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? There's one. I want to I add a passage, beginning of Acts chapter 5 says this, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God." And Ananias, Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, gave up the ghost, and great fear came unto all them that heard these things. And then you know the story. Verses 6 through 11, his wife, not knowing, comes in and does the same thing, and uh, she dies on the spot. Why do I read these two passages together? Luke chapter 12 and Acts chapter 5. Because in both of these cases, here's what happened. People were consumed with material things. And then all of a sudden, in a moment, in just a flicker of, of time, all of those things meant nothing. And I think there's a message to us that you can pursue all these things and it will seem like you're living the abundant life. It'll seem good for a short time. But the moment you reach that realization that Solomon reached, it's going to be an abrupt moment of time that you're going to realize I was focused on the wrong thing. 
and it's going to be that abrupt. Like, hey, I got all this stuff, I'm good to go, let me sit back and relax, and God says, you fool. Ananias, Sapphira, now. You lied, you were focused on material things, tried to hide it from God, you're gone. Man, the abruptness of that, I think, is the wake-up call that more people in this in, in our society experience than we realize. We don't hear that story all the time, but that's really what's happened. What will happen eventually. Yeah, and you're, you're talking about Solomon. And we read through Ecclesiastes and we get to the end of it. And does he ever give us a conclusion of what, well, what is the answer then? If everything is not profitable and under the sun, like, well, then what? Well, he says in verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, right? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Like, it ain't to go get stuff. It ain't to fill up barns. It ain't to pull barns down and build new ones. Um, it isn't to keep something back for yourself. It isn't to look out for you and your family and your legacy with money and possession. It's fear God and keep his commandments, and we know what commandments we're to keep. Absolutely. And um, I just think, you know, Solomon was wise. <laughs> he, did, he did a fool's... Uh, experiment yes. and uh, called out for it and he realized it and he warned us right there in Ecclesiastes and I remember having a conversation with Brett at one time and I said listen there's a lot of pain that people go through and there's a lot of suffering because people get into certain things of false doctrine or whatever and like you know I see God using that in some people's life but is it bad that I don't want to have to go through all that pain and suffering and just learn from their lesson and he told me he's like oh that's you're literally doing what Solomon wanted you to do. He wanted you to see what he did and don't do these things. Mm -hmm. The whole duty of man isn't to do that, it's to do this. Fear God, keep his commandments. And we get right back into Colossians, the, one of the passages, or one of the verses in the passage we read, verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. And I know Brett will get to it, but that one for me, yeah. what pleases the Lord? Well, in 2 Timothy 2, 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We want to please the Lord, don't, don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. What are the affairs of this life? Physical things, money, possessions, stuff, stuff man. that gets in the way. So. Mm. Yeah, even the verse, the rest of uh, Colossians 1, 10, what pleases him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Man, final thought for you? You know, Ed, you, you talked about time, uh, and it brought me to actually the, the next verse that I was going to go to. Uh, Colossians 4, uh, starting in verse 3, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And you know, we've had this talk before, Brandon, you know, I look back on my life and, and the time that I wasted, and I mean, even, you know, there were worse things that I did than just waste time, but the beauty of being a born-again Christian is that you don't have to continue wasting that time. Like, you can right now redeem that time, and that's something that, you know, I think you were getting at with Solomon and with Rockefeller and all these guys as they got to the end and they realized that the one thing that they wanted more than anything was the one thing they couldn't have and that was to be able to redeem their time. And we don't have to make that mistake. We don't have to wait until that moment in time that, that every, all of your worldly possessions just pass on to the next guy. Stop now and redeem that time. Take advantage of, of the time that God has given you to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Man, well put about the time. And uh, I love the reference back to the wealthiest men at one time, that, that that meeting of nine of the wealthiest people in the world at the time coming together and then seeing how dismal they are, their lives were and how they ended their life. Well, I, I did a little, I looked up something that I've done before and this is what I'll conclude with. I got on online and when you get on Wikipedia, which you know is not always the best source, but on this one, I looked up drug overdose or drug related deaths and this is a 63-page, 62-page document. Now, I will tell you this, from page 26 to 62, 
It's documentation from over 700 sources. So when you think of wealthy people and man, you just think, man, they had the great life. On the front of this are pictures of some, you won't be able to see it on camera, but it says notable deaths from acute drug, uh, from drug use include Judy Garland, Peaches, um, Philip, Seymour Hoffman, Michael Jackson, Heath Ledger, Mac Miller, Marilyn Monroe, Prince, and Ike Turner. But what's telling is on each one of these pages, you get probably 15 or so accounts of famous people that died from drug overdose. Do you think they died from drug overdose because they were enjoying their life? Because a life pursuit of things and fame and fortune for self-consumption did it? I don't think they died in the condition that we, so often we wish for their lifestyle and I've got 26 pages of people that said that that would, if they were alive today, would say, don't do it. Don't do it. They had to drown their lives out with substance. When all of the substance we could ever desire is in this book, pursuing those things and keeping, fearing God and keeping his commandments. Man, this is the whole duty of man. And uh, we encourage you to stay with us in this series.